The Coptic Orthodox community constitutes between 6 to 12 percent of the Egyptian population. Under the Ottoman Milad system, Coptic Christians were regarded as Ahl al-Dhimma, a term whose juridical implications included the obligation to the state to protect the so-called people of the book, Jews and Christians, including the individual's life, property, and freedom of religion and worship. There are two key aspects of this older arrangement that stand in contrast to how religious freedom is imagined today. One, unlike the modern conception of freedom of conscience based on the individual, the freedom accorded to the dhimmis to protect their religions was conceived in collective terms. This meant that each dhimmi community, which is, means, literally means the protected community, living under Muslim rule, was free to manage its own religious affairs, including matters relating to family law, inheritance, and divorce, which were regarded as an inextricable part of religion. Two, the collective freedom to practice one's religion in this earlier period did not presume the liberal individualist notion of equality that makes the modern conception of freedom of conscience possible. Instead, it was predicated upon a system of protections and obligations in which all legal subjects were first and foremost members of a religious community, and each community stood in a hierarchical relationship to the ruling Muslim Ummah. Over the course of the 19th century in Egypt, many of the restrictions imposed on Copts were lifted, including the payment of the special tax, the donning of sartorial markers, exclusion from military service, and strict constraints on the construction and restoration of the churches. Coptic Orthodox Christians are distinct from other Christian communities of the Middle East, in that they are known to have shunned offers of European patronage starting from the Ottoman period until well into the first half of the 20th century. One of the key reasons for Coptic resi resistance to repeated European overtures is a long-standing schism since the fifth century that divided Orthodox Oriental Christians from the rest of Christendom. Coptic Orthodox Christians are considered to be part of Oriental Orthodox Christianity. Following this schism, Coptic followers were subject first to brutal repression by the Byzantine emperors and later to aggressive proselytization campaigns undertaken by the Roman Catholic Church, all of which further entrenched the tensions and divisions between the Coptic Church and Western as well as Eastern Orthodox Christianity. During the course of modern history, Western Christendom has continued to view the Copts as backward and ignorant people, a view upheld not only by European missionaries but also important Orientalists like Edward Lane and colonial administrators such as Lord Cromer. During the 19th century, Coptic relations with Western Christendom went through a series of new tensions with fresh incursions of Protestant missions, initially sent from Europe, Anglican, Episcopalian, and Lutheran, and later the United States, Presbyterians. Since none of these had success with Muslim converts, they concentrated their energies on the Copts competing with the Coptic Orthodox Church for their flock. The discourse of religious liberty was crucial to the missionaries as an instrument to proselytize freely among Muslims and Copts without constraint from existing laws and prohibitions against religious conversion. They made ubiquitous use of international diplomacy and colonial and foreign offices of Anglo-American governments in this cause. Notably, the principle of religious liberty, far from being a secular instrument of state neutrality, was for these advocates closely woven with their desire to win Christian converts. With the spread of nationalist ideas and the promise of civil and political equality under the aegis of the modern nation state, Muslim Christian relations in Egypt reached a new crossroad. The early part of the 20th century is a high moment in the history of modern Egypt, when Copts and Muslims united against British colonial rule. While the year 1919 is known in the history of international law for the institutionalization of the term national minority, it is best known in Egypt for the Coptic refusal to accept this term as a form of self-identification. Egyptian national historiography proudly recounts the revolution of 1919 when Copts and Muslims mounted a heroic opposition against the British, demanding an end to colonial rule. When the British offered special protections to the Copts as a minority, they rejected this offer on the basis that they were no different than Muslim Egyptians. 
Subsequently, when Egypt's first constitution was drafted in 1923, Coptic leadership opposed the idea of proportionate minority representation. What was perhaps even more striking was that none of the Coptic members of the Constitutional Committee objected to the provision in the Constitution that Islam was to be the religion of the state. Famously, Makram Ebed, a prominent Coptic member of the leading Egyptian party, is known to have stated that he was a Muslim by country and a Christian by religion. This narrative of national unity, however, came to be increasingly strained as the century progressed. And by the time of the establishment of the Egyptian Republic in 1952, it was showing marked signs of stress. Under the charismatic leadership of the first president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the new republic failed to deliver on the democratic promise of the earlier revolution and created instead an authoritarian regime that eroded civil and political liberties for all Egyptians, including Copts. Nasser's authoritarian and despotic tendencies led him to break up the autonomy and power of secular lay Copts, instead strengthening the authority of the centralized church that Nasser could more easily manipulate. One consequence of enshrining the church as the sole representative of Copts in Egypt, um, as the sole representative of Copts in Egypt was that religious affiliation became the Copts' main marker, not their citizenship. After Nasser's death in 1970, many of the strengths he institutionalized have been reinforced under the two subsequent regimes with the result that the diacritics of racial difference, sorry, religious difference, have become indelibly lodged within the problematic of citizenship. Importantly, since 1952, Egyptian civil and political life has been confessionalized to such an extent that it is impossible for most Egyptians to think about what it means to be a citizen outside the context of their religious affiliation. One of the most disturbing consequences of this polarization of religious identity in Egypt is the gradual increase in sectarian violence over the last 10 years. The fact that perpetrators of violence go unprosecuted, that the victims are denied adequate state protection, further reinforces the impression that the state agencies are deeply implicated. It is widely acknowledged that some of the attacks have been actually perpetrated by the state internal security forces who act with impunity under the cover of emergency laws that continue to be in effect in Egypt since 1981. Copts, by the way, are not the only religious minority group that have come under attack in recent years. The Baha'is, who comprise no more than 1% of the population, and the small Muslim Shia minority have been targeted by the state security police as well. It is within this double-edged context of the confessionalization of Egyptian civic public life and the increase inter in interreligious violence that many Copts have come to question their community's earlier rejection of the term minority as a form of self-identity. For these Coptic thinkers and activists, the only way to secure government recognition of and response to Coptic grievances is to sh adopt the international language of minority rights particularly their right to religious liberty. Mahdi Khalil is a prominent Coptic activist who argues for aggressive foreign intervention on behalf of Copts, including the use of international law and US government action. Of course, as you all know, US is the second largest recipient of US aid after Israel. He strongly endorses the use of the term religious minority for Copts which he argues not only objectively describes the demographic status, but lays bare a history of religious discrimination that can only be redressed through recourse to international laws that are ultimately supra-sovereign over the Egyptian state itself. Khalil regards the Coptic rejection of the assignation minority as the result of the hatred and pressure from the majority. In contrast to Khalil, there are other Coptic thinkers, such as Samir Murqas, a prominent Coptic figure in Egyptian intellectual and public life who has a long history of nationalist activism. In a series of books and articles, Murqas has challenged the linkage Coptic and Muslim activists alike tend to draw between the realization of political equality for Copts and their designation as a minority. Specifically addressing activists like Mahdi Khalil, he argues, and I quote, they believe that they are bringing Egyptian consciousness to a new level that is not encompassed 
by the framework of national community. In this, they want to present Muslims and Copts as a majority versus a minority rather than citizens of the Egyptian nation. There is a fundamental contradiction between the two. The concept of minority emanates from a divisive and fractious principle, whereas citizenship emanates from the principle of equality in rights and responsibilities, and participation in the creation and adoption of decisions at all levels, for all citizens, irrespective of differences in occupation, class, language, ethnicity, or relation. Whereas the thought of majority and minority does not help achieve this equality." End of quote. These two positions exemplified by Khalil and Murkos define the parameters of public debate about minority rights in Egypt today. It would be a mistake to understand these two positions as peculiar to Egyptian history. Rather, they exemplify the structural tensions internal to the conceptual and institutional artifice of minority rights, particularly the inequality between first and third world sovereignty that continues to inform the discourse of minority rights. As I've shown, the discourse of minority rights in the Middle East is historically intertwined with conditions of geopolitical inequality, an inequality that has been perpetuated to earlier in the 20th century, both by colonial ruler and later by supranational political forms. Given this historical imbrication, arguments such as Magdi Khalil's that call on Western powers and international institutions to intervene on behalf of courts cannot be understood as colonial in any simple sense. In so much as these arguments presuppose and reflect the historical reality of minority rights in the Middle East. Khalil implicitly recognizes this history and the institutional conditions necessary for securing, securing minority rights, particularly for Christian minorities in Egypt. For Copts such as Murpas, the history of geopolitical inequality between the Middle East and Western power is equally relevant and serves as a starting point for any reflection on the status of Copts in Egypt. Unlike Khalil, however, Murpos concludes that in so much as the principle of minority rights was the vehicle for the subjugation of national sovereignty to foreign rule, it cannot serve as the instrument for Coptic salvation. Any embrace of this principle necessarily entails the inscription of Copts in this long-standing colonialist project. While we may be tempted to side with one position over the other, it is impossible to deny the imbrication of both and the paradox that haunts the discourse of minority rights globally as well as in the Middle East. While minority rights discourse could have taken a number of different forms in Egypt, it is religious freedom that has emerged as its primary site of articulation and struggle. In contrast to the 80s and 90s, current Egyptian public's debate is saturated with the vocabulary unheard of before. Hurriyat al-Aqidah, Hurriyat al-Mu'taqid, Isra al-Adiyan, Hurriyat al-Aqaliyat, Fitna Taifiyah, all of which refer to the idea of religious liberty and religious um, sectarianism. Civil society organizations that used to avoid taking on religious issues now regularly mount legal challenges in defense of religious freedom using the language enshrined in the Egyptian constitution and international human rights conventions, such as Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 27 of the ICCPR. When asked, informed Egyptians cite a number of interrelated developments that have contributed to the polarization, the popularization of the concept of religious liberty. Key among them, the passage of International Religious Freedom Act by the US government in 1998 that has made the treatment of non-Muslim minorities in the Middle East a central point of concern. It authorizes the President of the United States to censure, through diplomatic and economic means, states that are found to be guilty. The Act also established the Office of International Religious Freedom within the U.S. State Department to which an ambassador at large is appointed, and a special advisor now serves on the National Security Council. While Section 402 of this Act requires the President to subject states identified as severe violators of religious freedom to a series of punitive sanctions, it also provides for a presidential waiver that allows for exceptions when the violators are valuable trading partners or geopolitical allies of the U.S. government. 
Consequently, states such as Saudi Arabia, Israel, and China are often omitted from the current list, whereas others such as Iran and Sudan retain their place, place as states requiring US sanction. A number of scholars note that the passage of IRFA, International Religious Freedom Act, by the US Congress in 1998 was the result of over two decades of evangelical mobilization to forge an ecumenical vision of Christianity as a universal community that needed to be saved from non-Christian persecution. As Joshua Green points out, one of the central aims of this movement has been to remoralize American foreign policy to address religious oppression abroad, to harness the resources of the US State Department to bring about this change. The new evangelicals, as they have come to be called, are quite distinct from the earlier counterparts in that they are far more cosmopolitan, comfortable with the language of human rights that they now use ubiquitously on their, in their various campaigns, and that freedom of religion, now the bulwark of a number of Christian organizations, is cast as a human rights issue and websites of organizations such as Christian Solidarity International weave in and out of human rights language to make the case for a universal persecuted church. The evangelical project to promote the religious liberty of Christian minorities living in Muslim countries with the US State Department's force behind it has been a boon for Coptic activists, particularly the expatriate Coptic Americans who see this as an opportunity to use their political muscle as US citizens to urge their senators and congressmen to force the Egyptian government to change its policies toward Egyptian Copts. Consider, for example, Michael Munir, one of the most charismatic and youngest leaders of the Coptic diaspora who has carved himself a place both in Washington, DC and the American evangelical movement. Munir, the founder of the nonprofit U.S. Cops Association, ran for election in the state of Virginia on a Republican ticket in 2005, a bid he lost. And since the ouster of Mubarak, he also ran for a presidential candidate as a presidential candidate in Egypt, a bid he also lost. He regularly collaborates with important American Christian evangelical leaders in presenting testimonies about Coptic persecution to the Congress, serving as a bridge between lay cops and US State Department officials. Munir's politics, like those of his fellow diasporic activists, are complicated. On the one hand, they connect the plight of Coptic Christians with the lack of democracy, corruption, and authoritarianism of the Egyptian government, making common cause with other non-Muslim religious minorities and victims of the state's brutal policies. On the other hand, they also participate in the post 9-11 Euro-American demonization of all Islam Islamist political activists, regardless of their political leanings often painting the reformist nonviolent Muslim Brotherhood as a jihadi organization. In a world where US national security interests seem to devolve upon protecting fellow Christians from Muslim persecution, cops like Munir legitimate a rather simple argument popular within US foreign policy circles these days, as evident in the website of the Hudson Institute, one of the most important institutes to rally for support for the passage of IRFA in the United States. In this logic, Islamists are seen as intolerant, opposed to the values of democracy and freedom and enemies of Christians. The US as a Christian and democratic nation must therefore ally itself with the persecuted Coptic Christians so as to fight fanatical Muslims. The new alliance between certain sections of Coptic Christians, the Coptic Orthodox Church, and American evangelicals represents a departure from the past in so much as intra-denominational schisms have been set aside to forge, forge a new unity. The historical pattern that continues to hold sway, however, is a global power's ability to shape how religious liberty can be imagined and exercised in the Middle East. Not all Coptic activists and thinkers in Egypt view IRFA as a path to their sal salvation from communal strife. Samir Murpas, whose work I mentioned earlier, has made a number of trenchant arguments against IRFA and its indebtedness to the Christian evangelical movement in the United States. The title of one of his major publications states his thesis bluntly, and I quote, protection and punishment, the West and the religious question in the Middle East from the law of patronage to the law of religious freedom, 
a special case study of the Copts, history, citizenship, concerns, and the future, end of quote. That's the title of the book. I'm surprised you doesn't draw laughter. It usually draws, drives laugh, draws laughter from an American audience because uh, it kind of makes the reading of the book moot because you already know the thesis once you've read the title. We have a different sense of humor. Murpus makes, uh, perhaps it's cultural, Murpus makes two related arguments in this book. One, that the project of Irfa clearly is predicated on violating the sovereignty of the Egyptian nation. And two, that this violation is not only the violation of its Muslim, but its Christian citizens as well. He recognizes the difference in the motivation behind Irfa and those behind older projects of Christian proselytization but locates the continuity in the effects these projects have produced on the lives of Egyptians, Muslims, and Copts alike. Despite the historical critique Murkos articulates, the force Irfa now commands in Egyptian public discourse is transforming how religious difference is perceived and understood among Copts. Irfa's international reach has subjected Coptic identity to a new set of demands. Key among them, the demand to translate across the register of religious difference to registers of ethnic, indigenous, and linguistic identity, all of which are far more legible markers of minority differences in the modern discourse of minority rights than religion. Consider, for example, a controversial talk delivered by a prominent Coptic bishop at the Hudson Institute that I just showed you the website for in 2008 a talk that was supposed to showcase the Coptic plight and Irfa's ability to alleviate it. In this talk, addressed to the American diplomatic and general public in Washington, D.C., Bishop Thomas cast Coptic religious difference in ethnic and linguistic terms. Claiming Copts as the indigenous inhabitants of Egypt and Arab Muslims as foreign invaders, he portrayed the con con conversion of Copts to Islam in sixth century, not simply as a religious conversion, but also a loss of ethnic and linguistic identity. And I quote, the Copts have been always focused on Egypt. It is our identity, it is our nation, it's our land, it's our language, it's our culture. But when some of the Egyptians converted to Islam, their focus changed away from looking to their own language and culture, and Arabia became their main focus. Are they really Copts, or have they really become Arabs? If you come to a Coptic person and tell him that he's an Arab, that's offensive. We are not Arabs, we are Egyptian, end of quote. Notably in this logic, conversion from Christianity to Islam is not simply a change of religion, but rendered as the substitution of one ethnic identity, Coptic, with another, Arab. To give up the Coptic faith is to also lose one's indigenous identity. In this argument, and so much as Egypt is Coptic in its ethnic essence, then Arabs and Muslims are not only foreign to Egypt, but also betray the indigenous identity of the nation. Given this chain of equivalences, Bishop Thomas concludes, and I quote, when you look at a Copt today, you don't only see a Christian. You see an Egyptian who is trying to keep his identity versus another imported identity that is working on him, end of quote. When Bishop Thomas's address reached Egypt, it created a raging debate in the media. While most Egyptian activists on behalf of Coptic rights have been accustomed to the minoritarian claim, they found the bishop's characterization of Coptic Christianity as an indigenous ethnic identity most difficult to sustain. While Bishop Thomas's argument sounded foreign to many Egyptian years, it was quite legible to his American audiences well-schooled in minor, min, minoritarian claims of ethnic and indigenous identity. It is not difficult to see how the performative demand of the political arena in which the bishop made his case, the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., required him to amplify the differences between Copts and Muslims, an amplification that seemed necessary in order to capture the attention of a powerful ally who can finally make a difference in changing the Coptic situation. The performative effect of this speech act remains to be seen. But one thing is clear that the demand for the recognition of Coptic religious difference is subject to a set of transformative forces that are well beyond the control of the subjects who speak in its name. In conclusion, let me make two points. One, note that for religious minority to call for international protection in the context of post-colonial societies is also to draw attention to the uniqueness of the group 
as, it, as distinct from the majoritarian identity of the nation. While this operation enhances and articulates factors within the identity of the nation, it also sets up an unstable synergy between the security afforded by the extension of foreign protection to the minority and the insecurity this protection engenders with respect to the minority's relationship to the nation. In other words, the fact that certain post-colonial religious minorities can claim international law to protect themselves from discrimination, and we must remind ourselves not all religious minorities can claim this, this protection also becomes a key source of their vulnerability in relationship to the nation. Their conditions of empowerment are also the conditions of their vulnerability. Second, the structural dependence of a post-colonial minority struggle for survival on supranational forms of support requires a certain amplification of the difference to draw attention to their flight. This amplification is not simply a feature of the victim's hyperbole, but a necessary feature of making one's discrim discrimination legible in terms that are internal to the international discourse of minority rights and religious freedom. As I've shown, one transformation rendered in the modern meaning of minority is the shift from religious identity to an emphasis on linguistic, ethnic, cultural, and racial identity. This shift in part owes to the ascendance of the nation state as the primary political form and the kinds of differences that are significant to its ideological and organizational structure. As Bishop Thomas's speech to the Hudson Institute makes clear, in order for the Coptic plight to register in the theater of minority rights, it must be made commensurate with other kinds of injury that are at the core of minority rights discourse in Euro-America. As a result, Bishop Thomas plays to the proclivities of his American audience and the parameters of distinction internal to the discourse of the Hudson Institute, as well as international human rights discourse on minorities. But in making religious difference commensurate with ethnic and linguistic difference, Bishop Thomas's discourse introduces two fundamental instabilities. One, the suturing of religious difference to other kinds of differences, differences weakens the very identity on the basis of which Copts claim discrimination. Two, this amplification of differences sets Copts further apart from the Egyptian nation and its social fabric. Such a polemical accentuation of Coptic difference from Egypt's Arab and Muslim history may well gain foreign protections, but it also makes the project of finding ways of living together more difficult. The paradox that haunts the post-colonial religious minority in this moment is precisely that the terms that run, render religious discrimination legible are also the terms that structure religious identity to other forms of difference, and doing so, they suture religious identity to other forms of difference, and in doing so, make the minority identity unstable as much as it weakens the possibility of forging a collective life together. Thank you. <laughs>